Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here at the um, Chelsea Community Center. I think, as most of you know, this is my first visit to Singapore. My main reason uh, for coming here is for tomorrow's and day after tomorrow's uh, Grand Puja events. But before that, as a sort of build up to, to the main event, I, I was asked to uh, give a talk. And I think the Four Noble Truths is a very is a good place to start. I'm sure that um, most of you have heard of the Four Noble Truths. The Four Noble Truths before. Before that, I thought I would uh, talk a little bit about the source of these teachings. And obviously, you know, uh, the great teacher, the Buddha Shakyamuni, uh, gave uh, gave his gave many teachings, and his first. Um, sermon was the teachings on the Four Noble Truths and and Buddha Shakyamuni he started off uh, as like any of us and he was um, born he was born a prince and uh, soon after his birth uh, a holy man uh, predicted uh, predicted that if, if the child were to become a king, he would become the king of kings, a great king, and if he decided to become, uh, decided, to, decided to follow the unworldly life, then he would become a great uh, teacher. So, because of this prediction, the king, uh, 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 Prince Siddhartha's father, uh, was very concerned and he did his best to keep the young prince from seeing any sort of displeasure and he of course wanted uh, his young son to become a king and as he grew up then uh, he was of uh, the, the the greatest teachers were invited you know from around the kingdom and he was trained in the in the in, in all sort of uh, studies, including arts and, uh, and and other fields, and then he was married off to, I think, uh, a cousin in, in his uh, teens. And uh, after many years of living in the palace, then he want he wanted to see out see life outside the palace, and so he went on a country tour. And on this tour, he saw a sick, uh, a sick person, and uh, uh, also uh, an an old person, and uh, and uh, and death, and he and he also saw a a person peacefully sitting under under a tree and meditating. So these are known as the four sights. And uh, he was greatly disturbed by the first three sides. And then when he saw the fourth side, then it inspired him to, it inspired him on how to uh, overcome those three sufferings. And then um, he um, did six years of hardship and lots of meditation. Uh, meditations and then at the end he achieved enlightenment so after he became enlightened then I think the rest of the rest of the story I think you know and then when he was in during those six years there were five companions and I think it's somewhere in the sixth sixth year of all those years of hardships you know uh, finally he 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 started eating and and then the five companions thought that you know this uh, 
uh, this person he lost his his uh, his motivation and that he broke his vow so they abandoned him and and then after after uh, buddha became enlightened when they met him when they met him somehow he was so different and uh, i think the story goes that they had this ag agreement that they will not bow to him and will not serve him anything and will not show any respect. But when, when he came nearby, one had to uh, bow down and the other had to get down the mattress and they had, they had to do all this because they could not bear his, his radiance. Yes, and of course we know uh, Buddha as the Buddha, the enlightened one, the holy one, the great teacher. But as a person, who was he? You know, what? Uh, how did he think? What? Uh, what kind of a person uh, was the Buddha? I think anyone who have seen him would describe him as a very simple person, and uh, he was also a very open person. During during the Buddha's time. In the, in the society, there was a very strong bias against, uh, particularly against women. Buddha was strongly against this. And also there was, uh, there, was a, uh, there was a caste system, a social ordering system during that time, and, and Buddha did not believe in such things. Okay, so uh, going back, to, uh, back to the story, so, so the five companions, they were quite startled, and then uh, they asked, you know, they asked the Buddha what he, has, what he had achieved. And the, and the Buddha then gave the teachings on the Four Noble Truths. Uh, do, uh, do, do, do I need to count the Four Noble Truths? Anyway, I'll just count. The Four Noble Truths are the first noble truth is the truth of suffering and then the second one is truth of the origin of suffering the third one is the cessation the truth of the cessation of suffering and then the fourth the last one is the path the truth of the path that leads to the cessation of suffering so with the with the first truth which is suffering why did buddha begin his truth, you know, what he had achieved when he began to share that, why did he begin from suffering? Why didn't he talk about liberation, some high things? Why did he begin from suffering? He began with suffering because suffering is the present. It is, it, it, it is an inconvenient truth, but nevertheless you cannot deny that. And uh, when Buddhists speak about suffering, uh, they usually refer to one of the three types of suffering. So the three types of suffering are the suffering of suffering, suffering of change, and the all-pervasive suffering. And uh, so, so the first type of suffering, which is the suffering of suffering, is, is the suffering that most of us will associate as suffering that we can that we know that they are suffering so this is on on level one and since it's level one it's easy i'm you sure i'm sure most of us when we were when we were young we played lots of games so level one is always easy <laughs> and then uh, on level two now it's going to get a little harder it is the suffering of change so these suffering are the emotions, the feelings that we usually regard as, as pleasure. So why do we call this pleasure? Why do we call the feelings that we, uh, that we associate with, with happiness, pleasure, why do, they, why do we call them suffering? Because they appear to us as, as, suffer, uh, as pleasure because relatively they are um, they, are, they don't feel as bad as the first type of suffering. But with this second type of suffering, if you spend too much time with it, then over time it will sort of expose its true nature. 
And then we have the third type of suffering, which is called the all-pervasive suffering. And here, when we say all-pervasive, we mean that uh, everything you know that is uh, um, that is that is a conditioned existence. A anything that is conditioned existence would. Uh, would fall into this category, will, will fall into the third category of suffering. So conditioned means uh, being conditioned by karma and klesha. Karma is a karma and klesha, those two words, they're both Sanskrit terms and karma is action and klesha. There, there are many English translations, but I think afflictive, aff afflictions or afflictive emotions, I think, is the more widely used term. And then, uh, so suffering, when Buddha talked of suffering, of course his intention was, was to you know, free us from suffering. Suffering, of course, even though all of us, we don't desire suffering, we want to be free from suffering. It, suffering cannot be taken from us like you can take out a throne, a, a thorn. Thorn. You cannot take uh, suffering away like you could take a thorn. Nor can you take medicines or like antidepressants, Prozac, you know, you cannot take those and then be happy. Because if you, take, if you do take those medicines, then I think pretty soon you, you will start to take even more and, and more and more. And then pretty soon, because of the accumulation of all these chemicals, I'm sure you'll have adverse side effects. So then, uh, so then the medicine that was, that was meant to minimize suffering creates more suffering. So because suffering cannot be taken away like by a magic wand, so how do you how do you extinguish, how do you destroy, how do you make it go away? How do you make suffering go away? You of course have to uh, contemplate, think about what brought those sufferings into being. In other words, you need to search for the roots of suffering. And the roots of suffering are, like I said before, the uh, karma and klesha. So karma refers to the uh, the actions that we that we uh, that we perform every you know that we always have. It is actions like the body, the body actions, the speech actions, and the mental actions. And the clashes, the clasher is the disturbed emotions, the, afflic the the afflictions that we have. So. Uh, desire and anger. These are, I think, like two of the most prevalent emotions that we have and that we can also sort of um, uh, recognize that we do possess. And both uh, desire and anger, even though they are, in a way, they contradict each other, that they are so different from each other, even though they are so different in, in those aspects, yet they both have the same roots. They both arise as a result of ignorance. So those three, you know, so these three are the true axis of evil. You know that? Hey, you, you know the term, axis of evil. You have heard that before, right? So these three are the axis of evil. And uh, when we say ignorance, what do we really mean by that? Ignorance is not seeing things in the right way. And what is this right way of seeing things and the wrong way of seeing things? After all, right and wrong, they're both, they both subjective, they're not objective. So I think here in this context, right and wrong is, I think, uh, in order to uh, attain liberation, uh, moksha, this third type of, this, uh, this third, the third truth, in order to attain liberation, if it helps, you could say it's right, and if it diverts you from that goal, then it, it, it can be wrong. 
So when we talk of ignorance, we usually talk of the self-grasping mind, the self-grasping mind. But I must warn you that, uh, that when we say the self-grasping mind, the self as in self-grasping mind does not refer to self as in myself. <laughs> yes. So when we say the self-grasping mind, that self is not the self as in myself or yourself. It's a different self. I don't, know, I don't know if that works, works in Chinese because no. you might have different words, but it, in English it, they sound the same. Right, so here when we, uh, when we say self-grasping, this self is the self that does not exist. This is the self that uh, is to be negated. This is the self that is the opposite of emptiness, of shunyata. And what is this self? You know, how, uh, how if, if I were to describe this, then if, if such a self exists, then it has to be an object that is independent of all others, that will be singular, that will be perhaps even permanent. If such a self exists, then that object has to be exist in such a way. Okay, so so this ignorance it, it grasps uh, phenomena as as independent objects, as objects that are independent of other causes and other conditions. For an example, when when I think of myself, you know. I sometimes get this like wrong concept that I am independent of others. So if I have this, if I have a very strong, if I have a strong thought, you know, like, like that, then I would, it will of course um, make the ego bigger. It will make the I bigger. You now my I, my I becomes, it grows, huh? it, 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 it becomes bigger. Because, uh, because if I, if I, if if that's how I see myself, then I would also project that same way of seeing onto external objects as well. And then, uh, when I when I apply that way of seeing onto onto an object that I that that appears pleasant, that results in desire. And when I apply that to an object that does not give give pleasure that I don't like, then that brings about anger. So it is not just uh, seeing good things or seeing unpleasant things that arise that results in desire and anger, but it has to come with the aid of, of, of ignorance of this fundamentally wrong view of things. And, and, that, and that is how um, and, and out of that, out, out of those emotions, then those emotions sort of leads us to actions. But when we talk of suffering and its causes, we should not think as suffering as one stationary object and then the cause, like the first cause, you know, like the, the, the beginning cause, the, f the number one or the first beginning cause of that suffering. We should not think in, in those terms. So if, 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 if we think like that, then, um, then you can ask, then one can ask, well, if there really was like the first cause to suffering, then you, can, then you might as well as ask what caused the first cause. And the person at that time, where did he come from, you know? Whoever accumulated the first cause to suffering, how did he come into being? So you can ask those questions and it becomes sort of like the hen and egg, you know, which came first, yeah? So Buddhists believe that suffering has no beginning and neither does neither does karma or pleasures that those 
that those things don't have a, be- a beginning point. So one circumstance leading to another similar cir- circumstance. And then, uh, okay, so I think up till, uh, up till now I've been talking of suffering and it, its causes. So then if I only talk about those two truths, then I think you might become quite bored and, and even uh, you might start to think that the Dharma is very pessimistic. But, but the Buddha was not a pessimist, per se. Because after talking of, after talking of uh, the first two truths, he spoke about the way, uh, he spoke about the cessation of suffering and the way that leads to cessation. And what do we mean by cessation? I think it, it, it's quite obvious that cessation probably means something needs to be seized. So cessation isn't isn't just the non isn't just the absence of suffering but the absence of the possibility of suffering altogether so for an example these days i am a bit under the weather i have flu about a week ago i did i didn't have flu there were no symptoms so you could say that about a week ago flu was absent, you know, I was absent of flu and its symptoms, but, but there was the possibility that I could catch a flu. So cessation is, is, is about, is about uh, seizing the, the root of suffering. It is even described, you know, uh, it is described as being indescribable. In a way, it is indescribable because most of us who are trying to describe it have never had a first-hand experience. So I won't, so I won't describe it. <laughs> For now, it can be an idea to give us hope. <laughs> and how do we achieve that? How do we achieve this uh, ultimate peace that we always yearn for, that we always talk about. How do we achieve that? Of course, we need to then go and think about the fourth truth. And uh, we, since these things, you know, the suffering and the sufferings cause us, since these are not external things, but rather internal things that that things within ourselves, then the way that uh, the way that leads out of those two uh, annoying things should come from within ourselves. So it is since it's not external, uh, the Buddha himself cannot pre- uh, cannot you know present you the medicine. But what, what the Buddha can do is that he can show us the path and it is up to us to walk the path. So if, uh, if we were to speak of uh, on a more grosser level, on a more easier level, if, 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 if it is really hot, then what is, what, what is the ideal thing to get rid of hot? You, you go for cold, maybe cold air, will will then be the antidote for that hotness. So likewise, uh, because uh, those clashes, you know, the, the, the ignorance, desire, all of these things are not, ex- they're not external, they are all part of our emotions, our thought processes. So how do we eliminate that? We, we have to do that by bringing in their antidotes. By, by not going with them, but against them. So then, um, that is when we need to think of, uh, of the reasons why desire and anger are, in a way, uh, self-defeating. Even though it seems that anger and desire can, can um, can cause, you know, they can be like the catalyst of, of so many of our actions and, 
and they sort of it appears as if they can bring about you know some sort of achievement some sort of pleasure uh, uh, like that so ultimately they are self destructive but out of ignorance uh, not only just desire and anger, but so many other emotions arise as a result of that. So if you were to uh, try to get the exact opposite antidote for each emotion, then I think since if, if there are a hundred emotions, then we will need to find hundred different antidotes. If there are a thousand emotions, then we will need to look for a thousand different antidotes. So it wouldn't be very practical. So it makes more sense to go to the root of all these uh, afflictions and then try to concentrate uh, on, on uh, cultivating the antidote of ignorance. So that is why we talk uh, so much of emptiness, and uh, that is why emptiness is is a is, is a central idea, like a central teaching of of uh, Buddhism. So, uh, understanding of emptiness is indispensable for attaining liberation, um, cessation, mm. and I think. If uh, when we were talking of ignorance, you know, about how we sort of uh, grasp grasp as uh, grasp things as independently, you know, e existing uh, things, phenomena. If 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 we sort of point out point that out, then emptiness, I think, is is quite near. If we can sort of recognize those thoughts, then I think. If you just sort of flip that mind, then emptiness is right there. So emptiness, uh, in a nutshell, is the um, is the absence of an independently existing phenomena. And it, and in many sutras, it is said that um, emptiness cannot be just realized through. Um, through sound, you know, through through teachings and uh, through conceptual thoughts, it could be that that we, you know, that most of us, when we claim to understand something, we do so. Uh, we d when we claim to understand something, then I think. At the same time, for an example, if I say that I know um, what a cup is, you know, that I know that this is a cup, right? So, so this is a cup, right? This is a cup. So this is what we would say, this is a cup. Okay. <laughs> so when you say this is a cup, what what do you mean by saying this? Do you mean to say uh, a cup is a cup? But that would be very obvious, you know, saying cup is a cup, uh, a dog is a dog, a man is a man, you know. This is this is like this is not kindergarten. So when we say this is something, you know, this is not this, this is this, this is that. When we make all those judgments, it seems that somehow this ignorance, you know, uh, grasping, this self-grasping mind sort of arises there and really says, this indeed is a cup, as if there is something out there that is, that is a cup. And same things with, with, with cars, you know, with cars. Uh, when you say this is a car or that is a car, uh, it, if you try to look for that car, you know, if you try to uh, uh, try to say, if you try to look at the wheels, the axis, uh, the chassis, the doors, the glasses, the windows, you know, the steering wheel, none of those parts is really the car itself. So, <coughs> excuse me. So when we are, when we make these assumptions that we are so, so. Uh, so confident, you know, maybe 
then at the same time the self-grasping mind arises with that. Because, because when you're so confident of, 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 of emptiness, when you're confidently speaking, describing emptiness, then yourself, your, the self-grasping mind also arises. And if that arises, then what you're, what you're really talking is not really emptiness itself, because you're also thinking of it being something that is solidly existing out there. If I may uh, share like a little story, when I was when I was a, when I was younger, you know, I really liked reading comics, you know. So, so in India, there was there was this I think monthly comic, and in this comic book, they had they always had a different uh, like they had an assortment of different stories in one book. So I remember this story, and the story goes something like this: Once upon a time in India, there is there is a king. No, there is a king. One day he becomes quite sick, and of course the royal physician uh, comes and then checks his pulses, and then thinks really deeply about what medicine to give. But but being the skillful physician that he is, the royal physician prescribed some medicines. They, did, they didn't write the name of that in the comic book, though. <laughs> so he prescribes those medicines, and then he says, uh, you know, you, you, your highness, yeah, I mean, your majesty, you have to take these medicines, but you have to take them on one condition. And this condition was that whenever he takes, uh, whenever, whenever he, he has to take the medicine, he must not think of mangoes. You know, mangoes, the fruit, mangoes. And the doctor was very persistent and said, you know, your majesty, you really must not think of mangoes before you take these pills. Because, because the doctor, you know, the physician was so persistent, the king really took it, you know, very seriously. And whenever it was time, you know, to take the pills, he would say, I must not think of, man of, of mangoes, but then he would immediately think of mangoes. <laughs> So maybe it's similar that when we try to really conceptualize emptiness, you know, that this really is empty, this phenomena, this cup, you know, you know the car or whatever object there is, when we really st start to really make this strong assumption and say this is empty of such quality, maybe at the same time we are thinking this really is empty from its own side. So this... Uh, this is, this is my view of what it means, of, of the meaning of emptiness being indescribable. Uh, it's just a hypothesis, you know. I don't have anything to back that claim. All inspired by a comic for children. <laughs> <laughs> but the more, um, the more prevalent view of this point is that emptiness is it cannot it is indescribable in the way that it cannot be uh, it cannot be as clear to your concept your conceptual thoughts as it is clear to the um, the direct the directly perceiving mind which which starts from the third path the path of seeing so in in another words. Uh, emptiness is, it cannot be described in the way that it appears to the path of seeing, which directly, you know, which directly sees and realizes emptiness. Whereas with conceptual thoughts, there is something that sort of, you know, that acts as a, uh, as a go between, between emptiness and the mind that conceptualizes emptiness. Hmm. In a way, it's like trying to uh, describe 
how an apple tastes to someone who never has tasted apple. And then, um, so, so that is, I think, the, the, uh, that is the most important aspect of the part. If, if, if liberation, you know, is your main goal, and uh, and for those who are on the Mahayana path, then just having the right realization, you know, just having the right view, the right view of how things exist, is not that itself is not sufficient uh, for you to become enlightened. Sometimes uh, emptiness may sound a little abstract and uh, little uh, irrelevant, maybe. You know, how is it relevant to, to us? You know, how, how is it connected to uh, us on an everyday basis? Mm, but then I would, if someone asked me a question like that, then I, would, I wouldn't directly answer to that, but I would have a question for him or her. I would ask the person, why do we need to uh, work? Why do we need to do so many things that we do in every day? Why are we doing this? Why are we doing those things? I would ask, I, I would ask back. And there's a good chance that the person would reply, of course, to achieve happiness, you know, to be happy. But then isn't happiness in that context also an abstract? It is an idea. Oh, for happiness, yeah? It is not even a feeling yet, but somehow it's in, in, it's in your mind. You're just, it, it's, it's really not in the present. It's something that you only wish for. So in that way, happiness itself is also an abstract. And for, therefore, I might argue and say, in that way, happiness too can be irrelevant because it's abstract. If, if, we, if we know, if we, know uh, if we have a good idea of, of what we mean by saying emptiness, what, what is it being empty of, what is being negated, if we can sort of, uh, if we can understand that, then I think it, will, it can be uh, relevant to our lives. If, if we know how to correctly uh, apply emptiness, which is by, uh, by thinking that, that you are you know, just a product, that you are like, like, you are like a grain of sand in, on the beach, or like a star in the galaxy. You know, you are just a little piece. So you are not an independent, uh, independent, self-existing phenomena, but you are rather a little piece that is part of the bigger picture. And there are countless uh, use, right? Countless use, and all of us, of course, are in a way dependent on, uh, on each other directly or indirectly. So when we talk of emptiness, even, even though emptiness itself is the absence of an independently uh, existing object, but if our understanding of emptiness does not uh, help us in, in understanding that we are also dependent upon others, then we have not, we have not uh, truly understood the meaning of emptiness. So emptiness, thinking of emptiness is one of the main aspects of, of the path that leads to liberation and uh, full, full enlightenment, Buddhahood. But there are other elements, you know, there are other paths, for an example, like uh, uh, the practice of uh, gener generosity, generosity, gen generosity and uh, patience, you know, the six parameters. 
so the parameters, when we speak of the parameters, we usually think of generosity, patience, uh, moral conduct, and so on, right? Uh, how do you say Zundu? The fourth, how do you say that in, in English? Effort, okay. Effort, and then concentration, you know, and uh, wisdom. Each of these components themselves, uh, you cannot say they are really parameters. Uh, in order to be any positive thoughts to be a parameter, it needs to be reinforced by the bodhicitta, the enlightenment uh, wishing mind. Yes, uh, I think we have many analogies, uh, but now I think uh, we are now almost at the end of uh, our time, so I think uh, I would, I think maybe we can have some time for questions and answers, questions and answers. So if, if anyone would like to question anything, you know, put up any questions, please feel free to do so. Yeah, you can raise up your hand, I'll pass you the mic. 如果有問題的話,你可以舉手,然後我們會把那個話筒交給你。Rambuche, according to you, suffering is like part of everyday life, right? So, Excuse me? Um, suffering is like part of everyday life, so in life we will meet with lots of suffering. Right. So when we meet with suffering, what should we do? How should we face it? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, there are many different types of suffering, but one categorization is suffering on a sensory level, and then suffering that's more on the uh, mental level. So, so the for uh, for the uh, suffering on the sensory levels, then. Of course, uh, I think we will need to find the solutions. Like if someone is a little sick, then of course they need to see the doctor and so on like that. Whereas uh, the suffering on the mental level, it's it's more, it's 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 on it's obviously on a deeper level. So then it would be something like being un. Most of our mental sufferings is something like I think. I think the most, uh, most of the scenarios I think would be familiar with all of us. It will be something like when things are not going your way, when things don't, don't uh, work out as you were expecting, you know, things like that. Uh, and then there are other ones like when you, um, when you lose loved ones, then you have sadness. So, so there are many different types of I think mental sufferings. And also taking things for granted. That that leads to many suffering. Taking things for granted. And having great expectations. Expecting expectations can in a way I think we need expectations because if we don't expect anything then don't expect anything, you know? <laughs> But the problem arises when we expect too much. So too much of everything, I think, can be negative, you know. And then when you have, uh, when you have some sadness, when you l lose like a loved one, like your, like our parents or our, our dear, you know, dear friends, you know, people that we cherish, then we lose them. Then of course. It is a natural process that we will be saddened you know, by their demise. That, I think, should be accepted. That is, that is of course, understandable. But we should not uh, be so sad that it affects our life in a negative way. And such sadness will, I think, only come if you had never sort of thought about, you know, uh, the demise that ultimately that people will die. So if you don't think like that, and if you always expect them to be there all the time, and then having all these great ex expectations, having built up on that 
thought that they will always be there for you, things like that, then of course when you lose that, it affects, it, it, it will, it, the impact will be very strong. So it is important that in our daily life that we uh, you know, think about these sufferings and not just think of them sufferings as, as uh, happening around there that, that they exist, but we should try to apply them into our, into our lives. So, but again, if you concentrate too much that I will one day die, then again that might bring about depression, you know? <laughs> So you need to find the middle way in everything. Yes, and uh, I, more questions? Hi, I'm Mr. Rambuchi, just now you are saying that the self-grasping mind is actually different from the self. Does it mean that the self, when we talk about myself, we are talking the physical body self, and the self-grasping mind is the mind perceiving it? And uh, what does it mean also the self-grasping mind and self-cherishing mind? Oh, so your question is whether yes. the self and the self-grasping mind are the two different, yes. two different things? Yeah. And yes. So the second question is actually, what is the difference between self-grasping and self-cherishing mind? Self-cherishing yes. and self-grasping mind. Yeah. Yes. We uh, make difference when we say self-cherishing mind, that self exists. When we say self-grasping mind, that self, as in self-grasping mind, does not exist. So, <laughs> so the self-grasping mind, right? That self does not exist. It is the mind. It is that fundamentally wrong view of, 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 of things, of, of any object. That is the self-grasping mind. And then the self-cherishing mind, that self is myself. So I'm cherishing myself. Of course, I exist. So myself, of course, exists. So that self exists. And this cherishes me more than others. So that mind is the self-cherishing cherishing mind. And then looking at myself, right? Now this self exists. <laughs> I have to make clear. But looking at myself and then thinking this truly exists. That existence is the self as, as, as in self-grasping mind. <laughs> It's like taking some, it's like going back to college, you know, <laughs> and learning some abstract stuff. Ah, uh, this is a bit loud. Does that work in Chinese also? Uh, because I think the, the terms are different. Yeah, I, I, I really don't know. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but in Chinese, uh, self-cherishing mind and the self-grasping mind they are different terms. They are different terms. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. that that won't work. Yeah, yeah. But in in English, it's uh, they have the same same word, yeah. and also in Tibetan, they have the same word. So um, the Tibetan word for for self-cherishing mind is usually rang chizin or da chizin. You know, so da is self. And then the Tibetan word for self-grasping mind is da zin, dang zin. Yeah? Da zin, dang zin, dang zin. So, so two da's and two selves. And so it, it can become confusing, whereas in Chinese, I don't think that problem exists. Uh. So in Chinese, I think that no, is irre no confusion. Ir irrelevant, irrelevant. <laughs> okay. Yes. Uh, hi, Rin Poche. Um, you mentioned that um, one of the causes of suffering is ignorance. And um, to overcome ignorance is to realize or to understand emptiness. And if, can I confirm that emptiness, in short, is like the, knowing that everything is interdependent. And if I understand that everything is in the interdependent and I still have some suffering, what is my next step to cease my suffering? <laughs> yes, yes. Yes, very good question. Uh, I think within Buddhism uh, there are different levels, you know, different levels beginning with the uh, with the 
and the table chung and the table member. Oh. Yes, so the lesser, yes, now, now I remember the lesser vehicle, and then we have the, the greater, the great vehicle. And uh, within the great, uh, the, the, within the Mahayana, uh, there are two, two different types. One is the uh, Parjin, the Parjin Tegwa, Parancha Paramita, and uh, the other is Tandrayana. So these vehicles are basically like cars that we can get into and they sort of take us towards our destination. That's why I think we call them vehicles. But like cars, some are faster, others are slower. So the general, generally speaking, uh, uh, it might seem contradictory because in the Pranja Paramita, uh, right? Pranja, par Pranja Paramita Yana, uh, it takes, I think, uh, countless eons, you know? Three, three countless eons, three countless eons to attain fully full enlightenment, and in the um, in the Sarvaka, I think if if I got my term right, Sarvaka is the first Nyantu, Nyantu, Nyantu. Yeah. Yes, hero's vehicle. In the hero's vehicle, uh, I think it takes about. It takes much less than that. And then in the Pratitya Buddha uh, Yana, uh, there are three types, and uh, one I think is the, the, solit the solitary realizer. Uh, I think it takes uh, 100, 100 kalpas or eons. And also, like I said before, also uh, within the great, the greater Yana in the first one, which is the Prajna, the Prajna Paramita Yana, it takes uh, three, uh, three countless eons. So these are, these are, mm -hmm. um, these are big numbers, no? These are big numbers. I think business people might like the numbers. <laughs> uh, but then in the Tandra Yana, it, it is much, much shorter than that. Within, um, we say it is possible to attain enlightenment in one lifetime. So I think if we are, but, but being uh, this kind of uh, in order, you know, to attain enlightenment through the Tantra, through Tantra, in that short period, uh, you need to have, I think, lots of uh, causes and conditions, you know? You have to meet the terms and conditions. <laughs> <laughs> so when we say one lifetime, we sh must add a, there are, there are lots of this star and lots of fine prints. <laughs> And we have uh, great yogis, you know, who uh, became enlightened in this short period. Though it would be very difficult for me to prove that they really did attain enlightenment because it would be difficult for me to prove to someone that enlightenment actually exists in the first place. Yes, uh, but... Uh, I think we need to have these inspirations and we need to try we need to try our best to sort of tackle our every uh, our daily problems that that you know that we uh, that so many of us face and we have to apply the teachings you know the four no the teachings presented in the four noble truths and the teachings from the Lamrim, you know, from the Sutra, uh, from the from the text uh, books of the Nalanda masters. I think we I think we need to uh, study them and try to really understand, you know, not just the words but the meaning behind those words. And if we can understand them, then I think it will uh, be 
it, it, it will be effective in at least uh, minimizing so many, uh, so many of our uh, sufferings. So shall we move on to our last question? Rinpoche. Rinpoche here, right side. Oh. <laughs> okay, um, the Buddha is said to have taught 84,000 methods um, to transcend our suffering and to attain true peace. So, um, Rinpoche, great master like you, what do you think are the methods do you think are suitable for people like us, generally us, who are always busy with our daily mundane life? Because each method is basically developed for people with different level of standard. So, generally speaking, Singapore people, you know, we are always busy with our, you know, looking for money and uh, our day daily life. So, which are the methods you think, or method or methods, do you think are suitable for us? Thanks. Uh. Yes. Like this? I can hold like this, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, it is true that, uh, it is true that, um, I, think, I think the other way is better. Hello? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Um, Obviously, there was a reason why this was designed like this. <laughs> mm. It is true that the Buddha came, you know, thousands of years ago, 2000, more than 2,500 years ago. And in a way, his teachings are quite old, you know, older than many countries. Uh, and it is true that, that human beings on this planet have changed and evolved, you know, have in evolved over time. And of course, through the industrial revolution, I think has been one of the biggest, cha has been one of the biggest changes, uh, maybe two or three generations, yeah, has been one of the biggest, gener uh, biggest uh, changes. And, uh, and during, during those times, I think more changes have been maybe in the last four or five hundred years, more changes happened than, than the first two thousand years from Buddha's time. So, did, did people two thousand five hundred years ago, uh, did they have the same feeling like the people 2,500 years later? Uh, did they face the same problems that we face? And did they uh, desire the same things that so many of us desire now? So if we ask these questions, then I think we can come to an answer. And uh, I think, you know, people, in the ancient times, I think, uh, even though uh, they didn't have any desire for modern techno uh, technologies, but I'm sure, like, in place of an iPad, I'm sure they wanted a tablet. <laughs> tablet, like, like in, in the Egypt, you know, in the Egyptian time, those were called tablets, you know, the, the flat boards, they were called tablets. But nowadays we have iPads, right? We have uh, other tablets. But I'm sure even though they did not desire an iPad because it, it didn't exist at the time, but I'm sure they, they had a desire for fancy tablets. Instead of uh, desiring cars, I'm sure they desired bullock cart <laughs> or horse horse driven carts you know so these are different emotions that are aimed at particular objects but the emotions themselves are in the same category so because uh, you know people o over thousands of thousands of years ago had the same same problems like like ignorance desire uh, uh, jealousy 
yeah, and then anger and and all those the the, the six uh, the six uh, the six uh, root afflictions because they had the same six uh, afflictions. Then I think the antidotes should also be the same. The Buddha spoke about fundamental things, not some things that only apply to his society or or. Or within that time frame when he was there, but he was talking about fundamental things, you know, that we as human beings have in a way, but not really inherently, but it's almost, you know, if there was a such thing as as closest as something that is the closest to inherent existence, then it will be ignorance. It will be the six uh, root afflictions. You could say that they're the next closest things to being in uh, being an inherent quality. How how someone presents, you know, the teaching of of the Buddha, I think that can be sort of sort of updated through the ages. I think it should be updated. I think. Thank you. Thank you.